frightening first. An Ebola case is diagnosed in America for the first time. Strategic partners. Israel's prime minister huddles with President Obama in Washington. World stage. Hong Kong protests seek global support through digital media exposure. And family matters. The Vatican prepares to host the Synod on the Family next week. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, October 1st, 2014. Good evening from Washington. Thanks for joining us for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. Tonight, a shakeup at the Secret Service. The agency's director resigns today. Wyatt Goolsby covers the story from the White House. Wyatt? Brian, late this afternoon, Secret Service Director Julia Pearson resigned amid security lapses here at the White House. The move comes one day after her appearance before the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee in a congressional hearing focused on those recent security lapses at the White House. One recent problem revealed with the Secret Service, a violation of protocol during President Obama's visit to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta two weeks ago. A security contractor with a gun and three convictions for assault and battery was allowed on an elevator with President Obama. An agency official said the contractor was taking pictures of the president and behaving in an unprofessional manner. The agency official said afterwards he was interviewed by officers. It was determined the contractor was not a threat to Obama, but his proximity to the president represented a breach of security measures. Today, White House spokesman Josh Earnest also confirmed Pearson's resignation, saying the president was aware of her intentions. Uh, Director Pearson offered her resignation. Uh, she did so because she believed it was in the best interest of the agency to which she had dedicated her professional life. Uh, and the President uh, and, the, and the Secretary of Homeland Security uh, both agreed uh, with her assessment that it was indeed uh, in the best interest of the agency for her to do so. Ernest says the president has full confidence in Joseph Clancy. He's the former special agent taking over as acting Secret Service director. White House officials here in the meantime are awaiting a full investigation and a full review to determine whether more people will be leaving. Julia Pearson had been working for the Secret Service for 30 years. Also, the man accused of jumping the fence here at the White House and who started the whole questioning of the Secret Service abilities did go before a judge today. Omar Gonzalez pled not guilty on those charges. Brian. Wyatt, also today at the White House, Israel's prime minister was there. What can you tell us about Benjamin Netanyahu's meeting with President Obama today? Yeah, Brian, both President Obama and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu talked about a whole range of issues, from Iran to ISIS to even the possibility of a two-state solution with Palestine. But one topic that was uh, clearly still uh, creating some political tension was the issue of thousands of civilians who died in the Gaza war this summer. I think we also recognize that uh, we have to find ways to change uh, the status quo so that uh, both uh, Israeli citizens are safe uh, in their own homes, but also uh, that we don't uh, have the tragedy of uh, Palestinian children being killed as well. President Obama today walking a political tightrope, addressing Benjamin Netanyahu politely but firmly. It's the first time the two leaders have met since Israel's summer war with Hamas, which killed more than 2,100 Palestinians and 70 Israelis. U.S. officials condemned Israel's actions, but not enough to break long-standing support and funding. Today, Netanyahu was firm against enemies like Iran and ISIS. Israel fully supports your effort and your leadership to defeat ISIS. Uh, we think everybody should support this. Netanyahu also condemned ISIS earlier this week in a speech at the United Nations, linking both ISIS and Hamas as branches of the same poisonous tree. Confronting ISIS. The reason I went. Phyllis Bennis, a Middle East writer and analyst, says she's not surprised the prime minister also grouped Iran with ISIS and Hamas. The issue of Iran as a threat has become his political. Uh, inheritance. It's the only political issue that gives him any credibility. He doesn't have a lot of credibility left. His uh, uh, polls are very low. He doesn't have a lot of support, even his, from his own cabinet. Bennis says even though the president has criticized Israel before, she doesn't anticipate the relationship to change in the long run, as both the U.S. and Israel will likely move forward, focused on defeating outside threats from extremists in the region. President, first I want to thank you. 
The prime minister also says he is committed to a two-state solution, but it would have to come with, quote, rock-solid security arrangements on the ground. Brian? Wyatt Goolsby at the White House, thank you. Palestinian leaders want the U.N. Security Council to set a deadline for Israel to withdraw from all Palestinian territory occupied since the 1967 war. The deadline of November 2016 would include withdrawal from East Jerusalem. A draft resolution demands an end to all Israeli military operations and settlement activities. It calls for the opening of all border crossings in the Gaza Strip. It also asks for the deployment of an international presence in Palestinian territories to protect civilians. And now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Fears realized. For the first time, Ebola is diagnosed here in America. The sick patient is in serious but stable condition, now isolated in a Dallas hospital. Jason Calvi is with us tonight with the story. Brian, it's a deadly virus. It's already killed 3,300 people in West Africa. That's according to the World Health Organization. And now American health authorities are scrambling to make sure it doesn't continue to spread here. The deadly Ebola virus has landed in the United States. This case is serious. Rest assured that our system is working as it should. A man left Ebola-plagued Liberia on September 19th, landing in Dallas the next day. He got sick four or five days later and was finally admitted to the hospital on September 28th. The Centers for Disease Control confirm he has Ebola, but says those on the flight aren't at risk. Ebola doesn't spread before someone gets sick, and he didn't get sick till four days after he got off the airplane. But a nine-member CDC team is tracking down anyone who had contact with the infected individual. About 12 to 18 people, including five children, who are now out of school. The students didn't have any symptoms, uh, and so the, the odds of them of, of passing on any, any sort of virus is very low. Ebola symptoms can take 21 days to appear, so Dallas County health officials are monitoring those kids every day for three weeks. At the White House, they're urging calm. We have the medical infrastructure that is necessary uh, to meet the uh, to try to treat this individual that uh, does uh, have Ebola and uh, certainly doesn't pose a, uh, a significant risk to the broader community. The White House put this image on their website saying Ebola is not spread through the air or water. And the CDC director says they'll beat this disease. It is certainly possible that someone who had contact with this individual, a family member or other individual, could develop Ebola in the coming weeks. But there is no doubt in my mind that we will stop it here. And to stop Ebola, the CDC says the keys are finding possible cases and then isolating the sick. The CDC says they're improving their resources to find those possible cases and making recommendations, Brian, to flight crews and hospitals. And we just got word tonight of the man's name. The sister speaking to the AP says his name is Thomas Eric Duncan. All right. We will keep him in prayer. Thank you, Jason Calvi. A 10-year-old Rhode Island girl has died from an unusual respiratory virus. That state's health department says the child died last week from a staph infection associated with the enterovirus 68. They say that is a rare combination. The CDC says parents should be aware, but they shouldn't panic. This particular virus, the enterovirus D68, has a particular propensity to cause serious disease in children who have asthmatic predisposition, like children who get asthmatic attacks when they get viral infections. Those are the ones that are most susceptible to the serious consequences of the disease. For disease control and prevention says the main strain of enterovirus 68 has been seen in almost 500 patients in around 40 states this year. But it's important to note no deaths have been attributed to the virus alone. The House of Representatives is looking into the status of a U.S. Marine held in a Mexican jail. Sergeant Andrew Tomarisi has been in a Tijuana jail for more than six months now. His family claims he was traveling near San Diego when he missed a turn and mistakenly entered Mexico. Mexican authorities found weapons in his vehicle and arrested him. Witnesses at the hearing said that he should be released. Among those testifying, talk show host Montel Williams, who served as a naval officer. We know for a fact that Sergeant Tamarisi's time in this prison has been worse than his time in both combat situations. He's going to come back to the United States and have to be treated for his combat PTSD, but also his incarceration PTSD. And to me, this is an abomination. 
six months, he didn't hesitate to say, aye, aye, sir, to go off and serve. How dare we? How dare we, as a nation, hesitate to get that young man back? Mexican prosecutors say Tamarisi has not been a model inmate. They say he's tried to escape at least once. Pope Francis is calling on those with religious vocations to wake up the world with their testimony. The Holy Father is designating 2015 the year of consecrated life, fostering a culture of vocations. Some initiatives for the year were presented at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops headquarters in D.C. today. The group says it's hopeful 2015 will be a time of renewal for those living a consecrated life. It's also an opportunity for more people to be open to God's call to a religious vocation. How do you know God's calling? Because God's relentless. God is, is lovingly and mercifully uh, relentless in, in letting you know what he's asking of you. Uh, and you get to the point where the only answer is, is yes. The year of consecrated life starts on the first Sunday of Advent 2014, closing in February of 2016. In Syria, a double bombing takes a heavy toll near a primary school, killing some school children, 10 children among the dead. At least 12 adults died. That blast happened just as students were leaving the elementary school for the day. Authorities believe the first blast was a car bomb, then a suicide bomber detonated another explosion just as parents desperately tried to find their kids. This happened in an area controlled by the Assad government. There is no confirmation tonight of who is behind the attack. Anti-Assad rebels have staged similar attacks in the past. Coming up, tough rhetoric but relative calm on the streets of Hong Kong as pressure mounts for the chief executive to step down. On Wednesday evening, October 1st, this is EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. Thanks for joining us. It's being called the Umbrella Revolution. On China's National Day, students, activists continue to protest for wider electoral reforms in Hong Kong. Catherine Zeltner has more tonight. Hong Kong's embattled chief executive, Long Chongying, raised his glass in a toast to China on National Day, marking the 65th anniversary of communist rule in China. However, despite the music and pageantry, Hong Kong's protests show no signs of letting up. Long was heckled during a flag-raising ceremony. Thousands of residents continue to fill the streets, pressing China to give them a greater say in choosing Hong Kong's top leader when the city's first direct elections are held in 2017. During today's ceremonies, Lung told voters it is better to agree to Beijing's plans, with voters casting ballots after candidates have been screened by a committee, than the current system, where an election commission picks the top executive. His remarks were interrupted by a pro-democracy lawmaker, however, who was quickly hustled away. A local councillor also gained attention by carrying an umbrella, symbolizing the umbrellas protesters have used to deflect pepper spray. I think we have destroyed the values of Hong Kong earlier this weekend by shooting tear gas at children. Despite a hardening of rhetoric from both sides, a relaxed mood has prevailed on the street. Even so, crowds and road blockages are expected to grow sharply as Wednesday and Thursday are public holidays in Hong Kong. Catherine Seltner, EWTN News Nightly. Dr. Zhang Zhanli is president of Initiatives for China. This is a group advocating for a peaceful transition to democracy in China. Sum this up, if you would, these tensions. How did they begin? Uh, the last, uh, the, the most recent trigger for the tension uh, happened uh, when uh, China handed down a restrictive rules to select uh, Hong Kong's uh, chief executive, uh, which um, uh, basically deprived the right of the Hong Kong people to choose their own leaders, which was uh, actually um, pledged by the Chinese government in the uh, Sino-British uh, Joint Declaration and the Basic Law of Hong Kong. So this is what the Hong Kong people expected. One country, two-system government, is that in jeopardy now? Uh, it's too soon to conclude because the protests are still going on and uh, what is going to end uh, largely depends on what we are doing now. Do you think Beijing will allow this to go on until it fizzles out or will they step in? Uh, the situation in Hong Kong is a more crisis for Beijing more, you know, than anybody else. So I don't think it will let 
uh, the protest um, persisted for very long, it will step in very soon. You survived Tiananmen Square 25 years ago. Are you concerned that this could build up to that? Uh, this is a great concern, not only for myself, who experienced the massacre in China. Actually, it is a concern for everybody, um, the world leaders and uh, uh, democracy-loving people. So we have been calling uh, for the international community to do everything possible to head off a second Tiananmen massacre. It's well known that the Chinese government tends to restrict media. And so I'm wondering what the people in the China mainland are seeing, and are we seeing the truth? Are we actually seeing what's going on, or is media restricted? Oh, yeah, you are right. The Chinese government um, um, uh, has uh, tried its um, uh, best effort to block the information. So many people in China actually do not know what's going on in uh, Hong Kong. But at same time, many people who are inquisitive, inquisitive enough, they can find a way to find uh, uh, the source information. So they learn what's going on, what's unfolding in, in Hong Kong. And doesn't the attention of the world actually build into what they're doing? I mean, it really empowers this protest, doesn't it? Oh, of course, we uh, try to do everything to empower the people in Hong Kong. So they have every right to choose their own leaders. What about the U.S.? It seems to have taken a hands-off policy. What do you think? Uh, the, the U.S. has made some uh, statement which we don't think it is strong enough. I think th it is a crucial moment for the U.S. government to send a strong and a clear message to Beijing. A second Tiananmen massacre is unacceptable. Unacceptable. Dr. Yeah. Zhang Zhanli, Initiatives for China, thanks for being with us tonight. We appreciate Thank you, you very Brian. much. Well, the election could hinge on religious voters. Not here in the U.S., by the way. Brazil's presidential vote is at the end of this month. Brazil's current Catholic president, Gilma Rousseff, rarely spoke about religion before her re-election, or before her campaign, I should say. Now, she's courting Pentecostal churches, quoting the Psalms. Her challenger, evangelical Christian Marina Silva, is avoiding campaigning at churches, trying to appease Brazil's secular voters. Silva is seen as a serious threat, to Rousseff, as the nation's Pentecostal population is growing, if elected, she would be Brazil's first Pentecostal leader. Up next, in Liberia, a shortage of protective gear and patients refusing medical help slow down the Ebola containment. And with the family at the foundation of society, the church prepares to tackle tough issues facing today's families. We appreciate you joining us for EWTN News Nightly as we return to the Ebola crisis focusing on West Africa. One major problem for Liberia is the shortage of ambulances. More than 1,800 people are believed to have died from Ebola across Liberia. In the capital, Monrovia, the crew members of a private ambulance service say getting patients to the hospital is extremely difficult. One big problem, a shortage of personal protective equipment, or PPE. First responders need this safeguard to protect themselves against infection. I have about 15 cases now, more than 15 cases. They are still calling me to get me more listing of cases. But I don't have the first PPE to pick up the first patient. Another problem, some patients refuse to go to the hospital. His family are saying that he shouldn't go. His family says he should stay. He should stay. He shouldn't go. I don't have a police. I don't have authority to force him to get him out of here. Patients dying at home is a major problem. They can potentially infect more people and spread the disease even farther. The ambulance crew leader that you just saw offered one final thought. He said, I pray that God will be with them because he heals. The doctors treat, but God heals. Well, this Sunday, the Vatican begins its two-week gathering focusing on family life. The Synod of Bishops has only held two previous extraordinary meetings. They're called that because the Pope deems the topic an urgent matter of discussion. Leading up to the Synod, Pope Francis has encouraged free debate and information gathering from regular Catholics like you and me. The Church in America is sending three cardinals, the president of the U.S. Bishops' Conference, and a lay married couple. The meeting's Vatican liaison for English-speaking journalists is preparing to face a host of questions in the coming days. Where is the question of divorce and remarriage and access to the sacraments may be a burning issue in many countries of the West. It is by no means the only issue that the Universal Church is facing. We have massive poverty. We have all kinds of problems in Africa dealing with the structure of family life. 
polygamy. Father Rosica says poverty, single parenting, and the crisis of fatherhood in the West are also key issues the Synod will address. More than 40 academics from around the globe suggest ways the Synod leaders can address modern-day challenges to marriage. In an open letter, professors, family advocates, and clergy address issues surrounding marriage and family life today. The letter cites cohabitation, divorce, and pornography as major negative trends. Kent Hill, an international development leader, and Mary Rice Hassan from the Ethics and Public Policy Center signed the letter. This letter suggests creating small communities of married couples. How does this look? How does it come about? Well, we have to remember that uh, marriages are supported by family, friends, and faith communities. So when we're talking about small communities, we're talking about two things. It can either happen organically with this network of, of informal people, or it can happen institutionally where you have parishes sponsoring mentor couples to really support the marriage, not just the couple. And let me give you an example of what I mean by sort of an organic network of, of small communities. And that's, uh, I had a phone call um, a number of years ago from a young woman who asked me to come over to her apartment and provide moral support because her husband of one year was leaving. And here she was with a newborn. I went over to the apartment and who is helping to move that husband out? The best man. And when I spoke to him, he said, I support him in his marriage, I support him in his divorce, and he just kind of shrugged. The church is talking about us taking responsibility to support the marriage, not just the individuals in their woundedness at the end of a marriage. Ken, as a recent convert, how do you see the church's teaching on marriage? Is it clear? Can we do it better? Well, you know, one of the reasons I actually became Catholic was because of the very clear and impressive uh, teachings of the church. I was very impressed by reading uh, John Paul II's uh, theology of the body, so that, that was very important to me. But it's, a, it's one thing to say the truth and know the truth and express it well. It's quite another to embody the truth in the congregations. And there's a lot of work to be done to help um, our people in the parishes be able to resist the pressures in the culture and society which are tearing their marriages apart, even if they call themselves Christians and Catholic. So parishes can play a key role, parishioners can play a key role in supporting marriage and helping people stay together. I know that women will play a key role in this meeting, in this synod. How significant is that, do you think, Mary? Well, it's wonderful that the Pope has asked uh, experts to come, but also invited 14 uh, married couples to be there. And among the experts are experts in natural family planning, in engaged encounter, in different groups that support married life. And women are very much a part of that because we're the heart of the family. And how can we as Catholics promote family life in our everyday lives? I think we, we cannot take it for granted that people understand what the church even teaches on this. Everybody around us is saying that these unions, they may say for, you know, till death do us part, but that's not what the culture means and that's not what we often mean. To teach that we believe that it's permanent and for the church to come alongside premarital counseling, and to explain what the church believes and help them get through those rough moments because they're going to come. But we need to do a better job of giving people the tools to deal with those uh, problems. When the rest of the world says bail out, the church needs to give them a way to stay in. So we really shouldn't expect big changes out of this synod, but reinforcement of the truth that the church teaches. And the Pope says we're all responsible. We're all responsible. To, we can't sit on the sidelines. We've got to help support other people's marriages, not just our own. All right. Mary Rice Hassan and Kent Hill, thank you so much. And thank we'll be you. keeping that synod in prayer as well. Yes. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for watching tonight and each night of the week. Until tomorrow, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. You can watch again anytime on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Good night and God bless you.